loving and gracious God, wisdom from all eternity. We come before you today facing the challenges of our times. Now we have to socially distance, but we can't see each other's eyes. And our eyes are windows to the soul. Now we have to face our social sins, but we have hope that we will love as you have loved, hope as you have hoped in us, act as you have taught us to act, with self-respect and with respect for all you have created. In your wisdom and love, you, O oh God, surround us with the mysteries of the universe. You give us our minds to think critically. You give us our hearts to enjoy the arts, music and literature and visual arts, which honor and glorify your creative beauty. You give us our wills to serve responsibly. You sent us your son to teach us by word and example. Send your spirit upon these, all our Fanban community, and fill us all with your wisdom, beauty, and intelligence. Grant that during this academic year, we may all devote ourselves to studies and to being lifelong learners. We thank you for Mr. Williams, who is with us today, to share his wisdom, his love for music, his journey of lifelong learning, and his praise of you, our creator. Let us all respond, amen, amen. Welcome to Fontbonne University's Academic Convocation, an opportunity to celebrate the beginning of the 2020-2021 academic year, our commitment to academic excellence in teaching and learning, and our Catholic identity. We welcome all of you, our new and returning students, faculty, and staff. Although she cannot join us today, we also take this opportunity to thank Claire Roach, class of 1959, whose generosity has supported the academic convocation for many years. Colleges and universities across the country are holding similar ceremonies to mark the beginning of the new academic year. This includes our sister institutions, Avila University in Kansas City, the College of St. Rose in New York, and St. Catherine's University in Minneapolis, St. Paul, founded by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. This ceremony, as with the beginning of the year Catch the Fire celebration, connects you to a long academic tradition, which you will be reminded of again annually and at your commencement. I would now like to invite Fontbonne Student Government Association President, Annalise Kaysen, to say a few words. Oh, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annalise Kaysen, and I am your 2020 SGA president. Oftentimes, when I'm asked what Fonbon means to me, I'm almost always associated with the word family. There's a quote by Desmond Tutu that goes, you don't choose your family, they are God's gift to you, as you are to them. And I couldn't agree more. After graduating from Confluence Preparatory Academy, I was excited to find a college that would be the best fit for me. Sure, I was eager to go to the parties and be a first-generation student to meet my roommate and make new friends and experience life's lessons. But most importantly, I wanted a place that I could call a home away from home. My definition of home is more than just a place to rest my head. It is more than somewhere that I can put my feet up after a long day. Home for me, most importantly, consists of those around me. My humble beginnings start from my devoutly Christian mother having me at a late and unexpected time in her life. So I'm her only child or a miracle baby, as the nurses would call me. I was born and raised in North St. Louis by her, my grandmother, and along with whoever else wanted to help out. Memories of my childhood are bittersweet for me because I had this urge to share and create with everyone I came into contact with. 
but I also wanted to stay to myself and hide away from in my own world where I knew things were safe because I could control it all. When I started college, I found myself being social in some ways and then not so social the next. The challenge I face is a very common issue that does not discriminate when it comes to age or race. I was struggling with the transition to college. Usually, when things like this happen, we have options. My first option was to throw myself into my church. I prayed and meditated day and night. My next option was confiding in friends and family. That helped a bit, but I was missing something. At this time, you could often find me in the Kinkle Center speaking with some great mentors. After seeking advice, I decided to visit the Counseling and Wellness Center office at Fontbonne. I was apprehensive about it at first because of the stigmas behind talking to someone about my issues, especially as someone that grew up very sheltered like myself. But once I did, I realized that I felt calm. I slept way better than I did within the first few days I had started therapy. Most importantly, I felt at home. After just one month of being honest to myself, I began to see results. And as I still use counseling services, I continue to see myself grow today. This specific event in my life led me down the path to where I am today as a 2020 student government body president. I know for a fact that I would not have gotten here on my own without those resources. So in conclusion, I encourage all of you to, all of you listening to be diligent in your life and to seek out those that are willing to help you and offering their hands and hearts to you as well. In time, they will become your family. I hope everyone has a wonderful semester and I look forward to learning how your journey at Fonbonne unfolds. Thank you. I would now like to invite Dr. Kareem Mason to speak next. I'm proud this morning to introduce this year's convocation speaker, Mr. Darius Williams. Just yesterday, Darius was named Executive Director of Life Arts, a nonprofit educational enterprise based in Ferguson, Missouri, that uses the arts to heal community-based trauma and develop future leaders. Life Arts is a multifaceted and incredibly vibrant organization focusing on educational, therapeutic, and leadership equity. Driven by his deep Christian faith and strong ties to his family and community, Darius describes himself as a creative, and that's true. He's a storyteller, artist, designer, writer, spoken word poet, and more. But as I have gotten to know and work with Darius over the past year, I have learned that he is much more than that. He leads with his heart in all the work that he does. It is impossible to hear him speak about his work and study without feeling the love that he invests in it. Darius majored in rhetorical studies with minors in history and religion at Wake Forest University, where he served on an anti-poverty student organization that worked with the city of Winston-Salem, North Carolina to create equity in housing, health, and education in that city. After graduation, he joined AmeriCorps and served as a middle school lang English language arts teacher at Most Pure Heart of Mary Catholic School in Mobile, Alabama, before returning to graduate school to pursue a master's of education with a concentration on secondary education in English from the University of Notre Dame. Currently, he is pursuing a doctorate in education at the University of Missouri St. Louis, where his dissertation in progress focuses on empowering black communities around the issues of food, culture, and sustainability. Even in his doctoral research, he reflects the deep love and commitment that characterizes him in all corners of his life. Darius lost his beloved grandmother last month, and as he reminisced about her with me recently, he said of her, food was always a pathway to a deeper love. It is completely characteristic of him that he would entwine his love for his grandmother with the research he does at the highest level of education. That's who Darius is. He embodies love of not only family, but of the dear neighbor without distinction in all parts of his life. Students, a deep love was your pathway to college and your education will be a pathway to many deeper loves in the future. Today, Darius will talk about the value of your education, not just for yourself, but for your grandmother, your neighborhood, your country and beyond. He, his talk aligns perfectly with the values of our sponsors, the Sisters of St. Joseph and of Fontbonne University, where we insist that you frame your own education in the context of the common good. I hope and believe that in Darius's stories, you will hear a call to use your own stories, relationships, faith, and education to build better communities around you. 
That is Life Art's mission, it's Darius's mission, and it is ours. With that, please join me in welcoming my friend, Mr. Darius Williams. Thank you, Corinne. <clears throat> There's a common misconception regarding the direction of his resurrection. It's easy to believe in a Christ ascended perfection when in reality, in his election ascended, he object and extend his pierced hands to the rejected, neglected, to heal, protect, connect, and confession. You, me, we individually, collectively, imperfect by nature are still called to be Jesus's perfected reflection, wounded healers to this ever hurting and ever healing world. Thank you, sisters of St. Joseph, Nancy, um, Sadie, Corinne, and the rest of this Fontbonne family for this incredible opportunity. Fontbonne University, my name is, is Darius Williams. And I'm, <laughs> I'm honestly just here to give you some good news. Your education is not for you alone. So let's go ahead and get this, this first part out the way. Because you are listening to this speech, because you are attending this very institution, statistically speaking, you're going to have a career, which means you're gonna own property, you're gonna have comforts. It means that you're going to be in the middle and upper class. Statistically speaking, you all will most likely have families. I say that plurally um, because you're gonna have kids and probably several spouses is where we're at in this world. But you're also, more than anything else, you're going to be educated. So what? Is that going to be it? Is your story simply living the American dream and then retiring to Florida? Don't get it twisted. Um, these things are good things. Right? You're going to be successful. You're going to do incredible things in your life. But if those things simply uh, lead you through the American dream, but, but lose its deeper sense of transcend, transcendent purpose, I think that we've missed something. So we started today we, with Fontbonne's mission and this in, in the incredible invocation by Sister Barbara. But I really, I love the mission and I wanna reflect on the mission through the context of this good news that your education is not for you alone. Your mission says inspiring students to become global citizens who think critically, act ethically and serve responsibly. I love the part right before that. It says committed to the common good through transformative education. I wanna zoom in on this mission. Because I believe transformative education is summarized in those last three things, thinking critically, acting ethically, and serving responsibly. And I hope that my speech, I hope that this, 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 this speech here um, just reflects my own life, and my journey through this mission um, and what I believe it can mean for you in the context of Fompon's mission and the fact that your education is not for you alone. So I just, we're just gonna start here uh, as well. Race is a polarizing subject. <laughs> and uh, unless you were somehow not viewing this, this, this live stream, this recording and don't see my face, I am black. Good to meet you. Uh, it is a beautiful thing. But man, by the nature of my image, every room I step in, I am a polarizing figure. I'm a, I'm a political statement by the essence of my creation. I'm not trying to be. 
it just simply is the reality in which we live in. And I remember being an undergraduate, as many of you are, and it was, it was encountering my, my blackness, this issue of race that, that first began to make me think critically. I encountered it both in the classroom and beyond the classroom, in formal and informal ways of education. I was forced to begin to think. I was reading new literature. I was having these new experiences. I had to think about who I was, my purpose, my place in this world, as well as, as my existence within the context of this society. And I had to think about this issue of the common good foremost. I think common good is really, it's, sum, it's summarized best as the benefit or interest of all. One of my best friends in the world, one of my college best friends, we had one late night and we were just thinking and talking and he expanded upon this definition. He also, he added a personal touch. He said, my rights end where your rights begin. In the context of this conversation about the common good, in the context of the mission about thinking critically, I think what he was trying to say was, my words will impact you. My actions may offend you. My reactions can and will often traumatize you, but thinking critically at its essence is always, always, it always means that my thoughts should consider you. Thinking critically means that my thoughts should consider you. I remember it was my first week and, and some of you listening now, you're freshmen, uh, just like Annalise was just talking about, you're gonna go through a journey, but man, did I have similar struggles as, as that young lady. I remember the first week on campus, I cannot make this up. I was walking to find parties myself and I encountered, I encountered some white students and they were in, 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 in blackface. They were, they had darker brown makeup on their face with, with, with a, a headband tied up like Tupac and thug life with body paint across their chest because they were heading to a party called Tupacalypse. You can imagine, <laughs> as a first week freshman, how I felt. I wasn't alone. There were a lot of upset people of color. In fact, I remember it, I'm, I'm, it's the first month of being there. I'm in these long committee meetings. I'm still trying to figure out how to be a college student, but because I was one of the students who spoke up about my issues with this, I was in these committee meetings about how to resolve the tension now being had between these, these, these various frat parties and these people of color who were the minority, not just in skin, but also on campus, right? And in that was the critical thinking piece. I wanted them to consider racism. <laughs> in my right to not be subjected to any forms of hatred, and these frats wanted us to consider their, their parties and traditions and how they view them as sacred and that they had a right to party. I'm not, I can tell you which I think is much more important. But those committees revealed something to me about critical thinking is that even as we make compromises, even as I, I saw some of these frats with humility stopped the traditions but didn't stop partying. We had to think critically about the common good in this context. I had to consider them as they considered me, my rights end where yours begin for the benefit and interest of all. You, Font Bont University, your students, your students who one day will be in positions of power because of this education and that's good news but you are also going to say and do some things that are going to both negatively and, and positively impact others. My question then for you is this, 
within those imperfect moments, will you be willing, humbly, critically thinking and considering those you impact? Or is your education, power and future status just going to benefit you? I'm gonna make it very clear, your education, meaning your newfound capacity to think critically is not for you alone. See, while race may be really polarizing, so is the idea of ethics and justice in our society. And I'm not going to tell you, you know, what your ethics should be. But I think defining ethics is important to start. I think at its most basic definition, it, it means moral principles, principles that dictate ultimately what humans ought to do. And, and for a really even more simplistic way of phrasing this, it's our moral consistency in action. Right, we see this on the smallest level. We see this with kids all the time. For those who have little brothers, little sisters, maybe you're a camp counselor or mentor, you, you probably see this ethical dilemma all the time. So, so just work with me for a second. Imagine a kid sees another kid without a snack and it's snack time. And they know that if they share, then that kid will have something to eat. Otherwise, we know that that kid would have nothing at all. But it also means that they would be giving, they have to give up a part of their own snack, and that's theirs, rightfully theirs. What do you do? It seems simple enough. In the words of my, my mama, oh man, I love that woman. She'll be like, Darius, boy, <laughs> you'll give some of your snack to that little kid. <laughs> You know we raised you better. <laughs> because the moral principle that my parents taught me was kindness. It was to treat others with respect, to take care of others. Right? Moral consistency in action. We see you you probably see this even more practically on your own on your own level. Oh, we're going we're going to go there for a second. I was a college student, I'm still a college student getting my doctorate. Paper is due. You procrastinated. You wait until the last minute. You're getting friends texting you, hey, hey, I need help. I need advice with this. But you realize you haven't even started yet. And the paper is due within an hour. A friend offers you their paper that they may have wrote last semester. Or you can look online potentially for a topic similar and begin to use someone else's writing. But what do you do? When I tell you that I have taken a lot of L's for the sake of acting ethically and being morally consistent in action because I can be a procrastinator, I took a lot of late grades, in some cases Fs, because it was what I ought to do. But it becomes even more complicated when, when, when emotions are involved, when personal attacks are involved. I remember the summer that Sandra Bland, in 2015, she was tragically lost in police custody. And as, a, as an organizer, as an, as an activist, as a creative, as a speaker, as a student, as a human, I helped organize a rally for justice a speak out on campus. And I remember that as I was leaving the stage, I noticed the commotion, a kid known, he was a white male, but he was known for agitating and perpetuating hateful words through his journalism towards myself and other peers directly. Peers who look like me. 
And I remember leaving that stage and seeing the commotion and, 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 and seeing my own fellow organizers and students, my peers, physically pushing and berating this young man who, had, who was, constantly, was constantly saying hateful things towards us. What do I do? So you need to understand something. Thinking critically, thinking critically, considering others, their rights, their rights, my rights ending where your rights begin for the benefit of all thinking critically should always lead to an ethical action. I lost friends that day. When I defended that young man. People who felt justified in their anger. And, and guess what? I didn't necessarily gain one either. That young man didn't care about me. But condemning the abuse that was happening to him in that moment was what I ought to have done. This is the polarizing dilemma for some of you moving forward. See, one day you will be the educated population. You will be the powerful generation, a global group of citizens, but will you be wounded healers? Because here's the reality. You will see more black bodies lying dead in the streets due to the actions of police and racism. You will still encounter misogyny, sexism, and homophobia in your workplaces, your classrooms, your places of worship, et cetera. But what will you say and do in those moments? Is it only that which is beneficial for you or that which is beneficial for all? For someone else. Again, I'm going to keep it very plain. Your education, your newfound capacity to act ethically is not for you alone. I like threes. Three is one of my favorite numbers. And so there's one more polarizing subject that we have to talk about. Money and power. See, I was your age once. I was, you know, I'm still full of life, I promise you. But man, when you become an adult, things change a little bit. They change a little bit. Man, I was gonna be a lawyer. I was gonna be a politician. I might still be a politician, we'll see. But I was gonna make a lot of money. That was my goal. And I was gonna make a difference. Man, I'm 26. <laughs> I've become a lifelong educator and a creative, which if you don't know anything about educators and creatives, they don't make a lot of money. But I'm rich in life and purpose. See, here's a, here's a common misconception. Because I want to share, I want to share good news for you. This common misconception is, is that you don't, you don't need to make a lot of money to make a difference, nor the opposite is true. You don't need to be doing the work that I'm doing with life arts. I'm impacting hundreds of students in North County. Through programs, projects, and pathways, we are living out missionally how to serve responsibly my community. But, but here's the difference. It's my calling, not yours. I wasn't called to be a lawyer. I wasn't called to make a lot of money. Those are good things. I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna keep it really simple for you. You are more powerful than you think just because of who you are called to be. See, here's what's really cool. When we begin to think critically and then supplementarily act ethically, we innately are serving responsibly. You have to be. When you are considering others, when you are making sure that your rights end where others begin, when you are thinking about the benefit and interest of all, and then and act upon those principles, 
you're going to serve responsibly anywhere that you've been called to be. Let me break this down. Future bankers, you're going to make a whole lot of money. But as you are learning about the inequitable realities of the society we live in and the marginalized populations who can't even get affordable loans to own a home or a business, you have an opportunity to serve responsibly and still make a bunch of money. Get people color loans at good rates. And I promise you, you're gonna get your return. Future managers. Yeah, you're gonna make a little bit of money. You're gonna be middle class. But man, you're gonna have opportunities to create a culture within your workspace that truly is, is about unity and not division. You're gonna be able to live out uh, an opportunity to create equitable pay for women in the workplace. These are opportunities you're gonna get just through who you're called to be as a manager. Future teachers, you will be broke. I'm sorry, I was a teacher once, I get it. But man, your job is more important than anyone else's because you're going to teach the next generation how to dream, how to think critically, act ethically, and serve others responsibly for the sake of the common good just because you are called to teach history, math, and English and college students. Today, not in the future, today. First off, you're going to have a whole lot of debt. But you're also going to have transformative careers, families, and lives. Because you are allowing yourself to be transformed by your education right now. Today, you can invest into Font by in the St. Louis community through serving, loving, connecting, organizing, advocating. Today, you can be volunteering your spare time at, or interning at a business that ultimately benefits others. Today, you can make your voice heard through the ballot, through a march, or whatever sphere of influence you've been handed today and tomorrow. In your pursuit of the common good, you right now are more powerful than you think. Your education, your capacity to think critically, act ethically, and serve responsibly is not for you alone. In conclusion, let's go ahead and get this out the way. 2020 sucks. <laughs> Man, we had COVID-19 and we lost our glorious summer. We lost Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna, Black Panther and countless others. Suddenly, Australia had wildfires. California is burning right now. Hurricane season is rampant and Russia is always Russia right? There's political polarization, racial tension, police brutality, and the 2020 elections haven't even happened yet. And I have to say their names. George Floyd, Rashard Brooks, Breonna Taylor. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. You, we individually, collectively still have the opportunity to be transformed by this education and commit to the common good. What's understood can never be overstated because you are here today, alive, breathing. You are more powerful than you think. Don't allow 2020 to be a barrier this semester. Instead, make the most of your time. Become those critical thinkers who, who, who are thinking critically. Become those ethical actors who are acting ethically. Become those responsible servers who are serving responsibly wounded healers. Become everything that you're called to become for this ever hurting, ever healing world. Because the greatest news of all is that your education is not for you alone. Thank you again. I know all of you join me in thanking Mr. Williams for your profound message of good news, as you termed it, 
for our students and for our entire community. You've called us all to a purposeful life and a life of service to others as we work toward the common good for all. We appreciate your candor in sharing your experiences to help us reflect on our own responses and our own actions, particularly as a university community during what I agree with you are polarizing times. And we're really grateful for your presence and for your message today. So we ask God's blessing on you, Mr. Williams. It's now my pleasure to commission our staff. Students, look to the men and the women who serve many administrative and support functions across our campus. I count myself among these. Some of us perform very public functions for the university by promoting the work of our faculty, recruiting students, and raising needed funds to fuel the fires of innovation, creativity, and teaching. Others may work behind the scenes to ensure that records are kept, buildings are cleaned and maintained, students are counseled, tears are wiped away, and our bodies are nourished. Rest assured that each of us is here to serve the needs of you, our students, as you pursue your dreams, which will be enhanced and fulfilled by a Fonfon education. Each staff member in her or his way embraces and lives the life of the mission and values of Fonfon University, which was started by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet to serve the dear neighbor. Like you, we continue to be on a journey of discovery in our own lives, and we will be shaped by you, our students, as you make your way through this place and into the world. Staff and administration, thank you all for your service to Fonfon and your commitment to our mission. Thank you, Dr. Blotner. Students, the faculty of Fonfon University are honored to have the opportunity to create a better world through each of you. Throughout this year, I encourage you to lean on the faculty for support, to engage with the faculty in the hard questions of the day, and to challenge yourself to make the most of the knowledge and passion that the faculty bring to their courses. Members of the faculty, your work is most central to the mission of Fontbonne University. While all of our work is important, that which happens in the classroom, in the lab, in the studio, and in faculty offices, and on Zoom sessions, animates our mission and brings knowledge and understanding to life for our students, regardless of their path to Fontbon. The faculty bring with them different traditions and come from varied faith and belief backgrounds. Yet each, in her or his own way, has embraced the charism handed down over the generations from the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet. They live it out in their classrooms and as a community of scholars. They are dedicated teachers who seek to impart their knowledge to you in new, fresh, and relevant ways. They are committed to challenging you and they are committed to your success. Learn from them, seek their counsel, and emulate them. To my faculty colleagues, thank you for your commitment to our ideals rooted in the Catholic intellectual tradition enriched by the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet and made real every day in these halls of learning. Thank you, Dr. Weihaupt. And now it's my pleasure to commission the students. Students, you have been introduced to these women and men who will become your mentors, partners, teachers, champions, and advocates during your time at Fontbon. They desire nothing more than your success as a student at our university. But you also have responsibilities as a member of this special community. We expect you to take your work seriously and apply yourself to your courses and major areas of study. We expect you to be engaged in intellectual activity and social activity, both in and outside the classroom, that will broaden your perspectives and create a context for the life you will live when your days at Fontbonne are over. We also expect you to treat each person, student, faculty, or staff with the utmost respect, mindful that we are all creations of a loving God. We are reminded by our founders, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Carondelet, to serve each other as a dear neighbor without distinction. That is our tradition, and I, on behalf of our faculty, staff, 
and generations of alumni entrusted to you today. Challenge yourselves to live up to these ideals. Use this time wisely for your own sake and for the betterment of our community and the betterment of our world. And now I invite each student to look at your Fontbonne University stole or pin that you received this week. If this is your first convocation, no matter what class level, you should have received a stole. All others who are returning students received a pin. If for some reason you did not receive your stole or pin, you can pick them up from Sadie Weiss in Ryan Hall, room 308. This stole or this pin will be a sign and a reminder of your commitment to our university mission. I charge you to be committed to the common good through the daily pursuit of transformational education, inspiring each one of you to become global citizens who think critically, act ethically, and serve responsibly. You are entitled to proudly wear your stole and your pins at each annual convocation and at your commencement ceremony. We hope that you've been inspired by this morning's academic convocation and especially by our keynote speaker, Darius Williams. Good luck this academic year, and I look forward to celebrating your successes throughout this year. Ms. Regina Way Johnson, Director of the Kinkle Center, Academic Support and Academic Accommodations will now offer the benediction. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we come to the end of this convocation, we want to thank you for your mercy, grace. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Allowing your servants to come together in solidarity of our mission. We are grateful for our speaker, Darius Williams, Fonfon community, and all that has been accomplished here today. May your heavenly presence, wisdom, and love surround us as we continue to serve you and our community. Please watch over our students, faculty, and staff as we walk in ways that align with your word and mission. We can do all things through Christ Jesus as we move forward through our spiritual journey. Oh, gracious Lord, please decrease our fears and increase our faith, faith during these challenging times. Expand our wisdom and knowledge and enrich our growth in all aspects of our lives. May we rejoice in the Lord always. May we feel God's love in all of our affairs. These and all blessings we pray in the matchless power of God. Let us all say amen.